Today, there are two million descendants of French-Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French-Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes fils et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French-Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. Now, this week's guest is someone who I suspect will be very familiar to most of the listeners of this podcast. Susan Poulin has been selected by Portland Magazine as one of the 10 most interesting people in Maine. She is an award-winning writer and performer. She is the author of 11 plays, six of which feature her alter ego, Ida LeClaire, which is absolutely awesome. Uh, Susan has a popular blog and podcast and is the author of two books. And last May, Susan was inducted into the Franco-American Hall of Fame for her body of work in the promotion of Franco-American cultural identity. Susan, welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Oh, it's great to be here. Now, maybe let's start off with your story a little bit. So where did you grow up? I was born in Jackman, Maine. And I lived there till I was eight years old, and then we moved to Westbrook. Okay. And now I live in southern Maine, basically the Portsmouth, New Hampshire area. Gotcha. Now, what yeah. was that first town? Was Jackman, Maine? Jackman, Maine. So Jackman is in western Maine, 15 miles from the Canadian border. Okay. I was going to have to check my main yeah, geography so, there. Know, I was not uh, familiar with that town. Yeah. Equidistance between uh, Portland and Quebec City. So 45 oh, wow. minutes south of St. George. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, so, now, did you grow up in, I'm assuming, was there like a lot of French families, friends growing up in that area? Yeah. So Jackman's was a pretty interesting town, uh, less so when I was um, there, but when my parents were growing up, it was about 1,200 people. Half of the town was French Canadian descent, and the other half was Anglo. So, oh wow, um, yeah. So uh, there was sort of a divide at the A and P. Uh, <laughs> and my dad lived on the French speaking side of town. And my mom, who's Franco-American as well, she lived on the English-speaking side because her mother and father owned a store that had been in her mother's family for generations, and the gotcha. town just sort of grew up around them. That's awesome. So were all your grandparents from that area? Yeah. My, um, my maternal grandfather was born in Quebec. Everybody else was around in that area. My uh, paternal... My grandmother was born in Skowhegan, but then moved to Jackman. But everybody on both sides of the family, uh, Franco-American or French-Canadian descent. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, yeah. I'm going to save the chat about the language you spoke in the house until we get to the TED Talk, kind of towards okay. the end. Uh, but I would like to hear the story of how you became a writer, performer. Like, how did that happen? Did you always know that's what you wanted to do? And how did you decide that, you know, I'm going to make a living doing this? Yeah, so um, I always, uh, well, people in my family would say I was been performing since I was born. But, <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Um, I got into theater in high school. I absolutely loved it. Then uh, I went to college and I got a degree from the University of Southern Maine in um, acting and theater and had a little company in the Portland area. In my late 20s, I stopped acting, but I came back to it when I was around 30. Pretty quickly when I came back to it, I realized that, you know, traditional acting is such a, uh, a powerless sort of profession, right? You have to uh, wait for a theater company sure. to choose a play that has a part that you might be good for. And then you have to audition. If you're lucky enough to get cast, you work very hard to serve the artistic vision of the director and the playwright. So in about 1990, I took a, a mime class, Caporal <laughs> Mime. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, not like a white-faced mime, but from Etienne de Cruz. So it's a French-based mime. Okay. Um, and it introduced me to this concept of actor-generated theater. Um, so we see that a lot. You think of like um, variety performers, like jugglers and gotcha. clowns. Yeah. They're actor generated theater, right? They're creating sure. their own material. But I, I love this concept. I'm an oldest child, so I have no problem being the boss. <laughs> and I, I liked having complete control. So I met someone else in this class, uh, Liz Corbeck. We decided to 
essentially put on a play. We rented a theater a year down the road. We both shared the evening. We each had to come up with about 35 minutes of material. We ran lights for each other. We baked baked goods for the intermission. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, we did everything, and, and the play was successful in that we uh, broke even. There you go. And um, I just really loved uh, just creating uh, my, you know, bringing my voice to the stage. Now, yeah. who is Ida LeClaire? Yeah, so I did a couple short plays with my friend Liz. Then uh, she went to grad school. I got married. I did my first full-length play, which was In My Head, I'm Thin, which is about women and body image. Oh, wow. So it took like big paintings. My husband is a visual artist, a painter. Uh, he was the one of the painters and the designer of what used to be the biggest mural in New Hampshire that was in Manchester. That was uh, a painting of the bridge that was on the side near the Franco, what, Hanover Street, I think it was. It's been torn down now or painted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, so I did In My Head I'm Thin, and then like I usually do now, still it's more formalized. After I finish a big play, I take time to kind of reassess and gotcha. kind of replenish. Sure. And there was, I was belonged to a writer's group and there was a call for a Yankee storytelling contest. Okay. And it was like, they were looking for people to enter from all over New England. And so I decided to write a 10 minute Yankee, well, main humor story. I don't really um, identify with the Yankee temperament. You know, it's not the culture I was raised in, although I recognize it, right? I sure, was sure. raised in a Franco-American culture. So I wrote this 10-minute story called The Stud Finder, which <laughs> about taking a new look at an old problem finding a guy. Sure. And I, you had to like compete in your category. Mine was contemporary in this uh, convention center in Keene, New Hampshire. And I knew I didn't stand a chance because I was doing something that was very different than other people. Sure. And I thought, well, maybe I'll get an honorary award for most sexual innuendo. <laughs> That's always I a valuable there award. Much sure. Competition there, right? <laughs> so, um, but I was shocked. I won my category, That's and awesome. I was in the finals that night. It was took place on the stage of the Colonial Theater in Keene, New Hampshire. Tim Sample was hosting, and Bob Bryant was there. They were recreating some of the original Burton I stuff. Uh, New Hampshire Crossroads uh, was there filming, and it was the winners of all the categories, and I was the only woman on the stage. That's interesting. And I thought, That's awesome. Yeah, it was men in jeans and flannel shirts <laughs> talking about the mothers-in-laws and competition. <laughs> and I thought, that doesn't reflect the funny, smart and strong women I grew up with sure. in Maine. And so one day I was just sitting at my computer and my intention was to create a main humor character, uh, a female main humor character. And I yeah. heard Ida's voice in my head fully formed. And she said, my name's Ida LaClea and I'm That's a awesome. home shop and networkaholic. <laughs> no. And it was 22 <laughs> years ago, oh. two books, uh, six plays as Ida, and nine and a half years of weekly blogs. That's awesome. Now, yeah. having somebody who's never created a character ever in my entire life, I'm always amazed by that whole process, to be honest yeah. with you. Now, so now you have this idea, you have Ida in your head, she's talking to you. Uh, do you like map out a day in the life of Ida? Do you, no, do you practice kind of Ida in front of the mirror? Like, Yeah, it kind of happened organically with Ida. I had that first story. And um, I did it in another little kind of review type play, but people really loved Ida. So I, I was like, let's do a play about Ida. And it was called Ida, Woman Who, Woman Who Runs With the Moose. I just started writing. I created her world uh, very intentionally. So she's Ida LeClaire. So she is Franco-American. Her maiden name is Gilbert. Because I really wanted to show that Maine is more than just the Rocky Coast, and more than just the Yankee culture. Sure. So even though she speaks with a Maine accent, she is definitely Franco-American. So she's speaking faster than those guys on the coast. She has uh, definitely has a joie de vivre that you don't get 
from the, that frugality of the Yankee culture, both emotionally and financially. I created Ida. I set her town. I created this fictional town of Mahusik Mills, Maine. I wanted also to show that Maine was more than just the Rocky Coast. So I uh, set this town in Western Maine, kind of when I'm uh, looking at the weather report, when I'm writing a blog, I look at Dover Foxcroft. So it's in Franklin County. I needed it close enough to a, t uh, a big city, in this case, Bangor, yeah, where too. Ida could go and have adventures with her friends, Celeste, Rita, Betty, Dot, and Shirley, <laughs> the women who run with the moose, but far enough away that you had the feeling of a small town. And it was also really important to me that it was a mill town because you're sitting there in Manchester, right? Oh, Knowing yeah. There's something so evocative about the view from a bridge in a mill town in New England, right? I Absolutely. get kind of teary when I think about For it. Sure. It just feels like it's part of my genetic memory. It's the same view in Lewiston, Biddeford, Manchester, Lowell, Woonsocket, right? It's just such, um, such a part of Maine, of New England, and of the Franco-American experience, right? Yeah, so all of those things were very intentional. I wrote the whole play before I figured out what Ida looked like. So once I got a real sense of her, I'd been writing for about nine months, I went and I bought her wig. That's awesome, that's <laughs> so I cool. I her wig as Ida. <laughs> and, and then I bought her clothes. You're 100% right about when you talk about the whole mill thing, because my, my grandparents actually met in the mill yard here in Manchester. And I, I go out of my way to walk past that mill every single day, even though it's not necessarily directly on my walk to work, but I make sure to go by every day. Just because you said there's something about seeing that mill in, the yeah. town in, New, in New England. No, I'm with you. I think that's so neat. How would you describe some of the characters because that's the one thing that i think is really neat i just got a ton of characters in her life she's got the family the job like what is ida about well the great thing about ida i find that um as a as a creator um uh, my husband and i were talking about this the other day that we find that restrictions spark creativity like gordon carlisle my husband is uh does a lot of public art installations sure. Uh, those usually have very specific parameters and uh, things they want to see, things they don't want to see. And he loves that because it forces him to be creative in a different way. And Ida is one of those restrictions that kind of sparks creativity, right? Because I, if I experience something and I want to put it in Ida's world, I have to get creative about how sure. I'm going to do it. I really love that aspect of it. Uh, well, I created Ida's group of friends, so that is the women who run with the moose have adventures. Ida's married to her high school sweetheart, Charlie, so she has a <laughs> main accent, even though she's Franco-American, because like a lot of my relatives, you know, you grew up in Maine, so you still have a, a you don't have a French accent, you have a Maine accent. Uh, Ida would tell you, uh, Charlie and me got married a couple weeks after I graduated from high school. He was two years ahead of me. Charlie graduated third in his class because there are only six of them. <laughs> so my, my dad, that actually happened to my dad. He graduated <laughs> third out of his class of six. So I, I, it's weird. I blend things from my past. I blend um, things that happened to me. And then some things just come to me. Ida also works as cashier down to the A and P, so people come, characters come into the A and P. And Mahusik Mills is this really fleshed out town, and I know I can open any door in Mahusik Mills, and there's a story there. And the fact that I write a weekly blog, so every week, Mondays at six o'clock in the morning, <laughs> uh, on JustAskIda.com you get to read a different story about Ida and you can either read it or listen to Ida tell you the story. So that means that I'm writing as Ida all the time. I'm always in the stream of that. And now my husband, Gordon, who's a good writer too, he started writing poetry as Charlie, Ida's awesome. husband. So that's another aspect that we have going. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Now you, you mentioned Mahusik Mills a couple times, and I wrote this one down because I thought this line actually made me laugh out loud when I first read it. You described it as a place with a wicked long winter, followed by two months of mud season, maybe a week of spring before the black flies move in, a short summer, seems hotter than it used to be when I was a kid, and one glorious 
fall. I thought that was awesome way to describe <laughs> a, a New England <laughs> town. I thought that was That's so cool. life, right? That's life in New England. Yeah, I think it is absolutely awesome. All right, so one thing I need to write down, because again, it made me laugh as I read it. Uh, you describe the yeah buts. And I think we all have somebody in our life. Oh, yeah. Who we could equate. What? Who are the yeah buts? Yeah buts is anybody that no matter what you say to them, they'll yeah but you. And so Ida... It first showed up in the play, uh, The Moose and Me, The Moose and You, which is a motivational uh, mooster piece, uh, I don't say, <laughs> motivational mooster piece. So um, it, it started as a motivational speech where Ida takes attributes of a moose and tells you what you can learn. So you can learn a lot about life from a moose. So in that, <laughs> she talks about the yabats and she talks about Claudia and Peavy. And uh, um, so she'll say, no matter what you say to them, they'll yeah but you. Even if you agree with them, they'll yeah but you. And I think we all know people like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I know. It's so interesting. And <laughs> one of the things I was wondering when I was kind of reading some of your stuff is yeah. I wonder if, because obviously you make amazing observations just about life because you're able to turn this into humor. Um, is it easier um saying some of these things coming from Ida's voice that it would be coming from, from yours? Absolutely, right? Uh, number one, I have to be more creative. Uh, number two, Ida, I, I really uh, realized early on that Ida can say things and get away with them. Right, yeah. Where I would sound kind of snarky, right? Me yeah. looking as me. But sure. I also did, I, I've done kind of experiments as Ida and me out in the world, right? When, before I got my easy pass, sometimes I would, if I'm doing like an after luncheon or after dinner speaking and it's only an hour away, I'll dress up as Ida at home with my wig mm -hmm. and I get in the car and I drive. There used to be guys at the toll booth in Maine <laughs> who they would flirt with Ida but they wouldn't flirt with me, That's awesome. which was really interesting, <laughs> something about Ida that was more approachable. That's However, funny. early on, I did experiments where I went into a really busy coffee shop as Ida, and she got really bad service. Cause really? yeah, so it's more of a socioeconomic thing probably. I would get better service in that coffee shop dressed as myself than Ida would with her poofy wig on and her clothes. It was very interesting to me. Yeah, that sounds like the making of a pretty awesome like dissertation. That's up because yeah. you know, yourself versus <laughs> versus Ida. Now we can talk about this forever, but I gotta save some for when I ask you to come back on the show in the uh -huh. future. But I will. I do need to talk about pardon my French. Can you tell yes. what is pardoning my French and uh, why did you write it? About 15 years ago, like when I started writing, I would write one play as myself and then one play as Ida. I kind of alternated. About 13 years ago, I finally got up the courage to write the show that I wanted to write since I started writing, which was about my Franco-American heritage. I remember once uh, uh, Robert Poirot uh, say Grace Metalias had to write into her Franco-American heritage. It wasn't so like her, I can't remember her fourth book or something that she really addresses it, right? It was a really complicated thing, but I, I really felt like as I was getting older, the my missing language, because I spoke French until I was three. It was my first language. And then I lost it. So it's bilingual subtraction, which is an actual thing. So as I got older, I started feeling, in part of my French, I call it an ache that there was something missing. And so I started looking at that and I decided to write a play about it. So I spent, uh, I wrote about 10 years of trying different things to relearn French. I collect, I spent two years interviewing people in my family about growing up French in Maine. Most of those people are no longer here now. So it was really great. I'm the keeper of stories in my family. I also wrote about an eight-day uh, French language immersion I did in uh, saint georges de beauce And then Gordon did research on Franco-American history and immigration and wrote some songs. And then we wove that all together in a play. Uh, so it has lots of little kind of through lines, kind of like uh, laces on a shoe, you know, where yeah, no. it That's all awesome. comes together at the end. There was, um, I reflect on this in my TED talk, there was something about 
you know, I went searching for the language, but I realized that it was more than just the language that made up the culture. You can still be Franco-American if you don't speak French. And connecting to the culture can actually help you relearn sure. French or uh, just can make you feel more at home, right? And there was something about just learning about the, my, my personal history, my family history, and the history of Franco-Americans as a whole that really made me feel fully integrated as an adult. It was, a, 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 it was like my story as the author mirrors the story of me, the character in the play. Sure, that's so awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like we've, we've talked in previous episodes about uh, the search for cultural identity being like a journey. And it really yeah. seems like that's absolutely what you had gone through in the entire process of researching and writing and performing this piece. That's so neat. That's really yeah. cool. Now, is, it, is there any way we can get it on film? Is that um, doable? I do not have that. You know, that was a long time ago before it, it was so easy to get, get good videotapes gotcha. uh, of things. Yeah, so I don't. Okay, we're going to have yeah. to find a way to make that happen. Yeah. One time only. We'll send Mike up there to do some recording. Yeah. <laughs> but we did mention the TED Talk a couple of times, so I do like to get into it, of course. Uh, it seemed for a while, which is kind of funny, that um, if you were a Franco-American in New England, you were talking about this TED Talk. Everybody was talking about it. It was all over social media. It was so neat. So how did it come about? How did you end up giving a TED Talk? Yeah, you know, uh, doing a talk, uh, a TED Talk was always a but bucket list thing for me. <laughs> I just, awesome. I listen to them all the time. Sure. I just love it. And I always knew that if I got a chance to do one, I would do it about this kind of concept, the intersection of language and identity. Well, my working title became um, my memories need subtitles, you know, cause that's what sure. happens when you lose your first language, you lose, it's like you you think of your memories and your memories are in a different language, a language that you don't speak anymore. Um, and it's such a complicated thing to relearn French if you've lost it, because it's so emotional. So anyway, um, TEDx Portsmouth is one of the biggest TEDx in the country, and they're in their eighth year. They had auditions, but I didn't do the audition. They contacted me. Um, they didn't have a lot of arts and stuff and humor. So they sure. contacted me to do an audition. So I did a, they, a video audition. So there were about 80 people this year that auditioned and they selected 16 and I was one of them. So it That's was awesome. um, so exciting. And it was such a nice process. It, they really support you in the whole process of creating your TED Talk. It has a very specific form, which was challenging and fun. Right, because really? it What's has that? to have an idea worth spreading, and it oh, has gotcha. to, you know, look at history and look at your personal experience. It has to be supported by facts and have sort of a call to action. So, um, in twenty minutes, <laughs> <laughs> right, of course. But you have like a speaker coach that works oh, with wow. you in terms of the writing. I didn't need a performance coach, of course, because that's something I do. But man, I was really nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I think That's I awesome. have kind of like PTSD once it was over. <laughs> you know, you know, you really want a good video out of it, right? Sure. You know, I was running it and running it and running the transitions and running it and running it. And I was, I found out I was going to be last out of 16 people. Oh, that's nuts. <laughs> I know. And it was at the Music Hall uh, Theater in, in, in Portsmouth and it was sold out, 800 people. Looks packed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a little nerve wracking. <laughs> but mostly um, people go, oh, why are you nervous? You perform all the time. And what I didn't say, but I can say now is if you perform all the time, you know that you can be really rested and well prepared and something can happen when you're on stage, whether it's somebody who crinkles a water bottle and you can sure. lose your point of focus. The only difference between a professional and a non-professional is your ability to bounce back from a mistake. Yeah, and no, that's awesome. All the time, like in the Olympics, right? Everybody's prepared for this moment. And some people have a magical day 
Some people have a solid day and other people can't put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> There's no rhyme or reason, right? Yeah, sure. Like the next day they can be brilliant. And so I knew all that going into it, right? <laughs> I'm like, just want a good video that I can feel proud to send out. Bringing the Franco-American experience to the stage and making the Franco-American experience visible because we're very invisible, right? right? right is a radical idea and it was really important that i represented our people right yeah, and that's awesome. so i did it and i i did have a magical day yeah, and i came awesome. off stage and i'm like shaking and, crying. <laughs> and i said to the guy as he's taking my microphone off i'm like wow i nailed it i did okay <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> it was so funny no you're TED Talk starts with you uh, sitting in a hypnotherapist's yeah. office. Maybe you could explain why you are there. I was being hypnotized to help me find the French in my head. So a linguist that I uh, t spoke, had spoken to said that, you know, a heritage language can't be totally lost. There's still a language map in your mind. So I thought, well, I can't seem to access it. It's probably not a lot of language but maybe hypnotherapy will work. I don't, I get in, into it in the play. I don't, didn't have time in the TED Talk. So when I did do it, what happened was I went, you know, they talked me down, they hypnotized me. All of a sudden I was in this secret garden and I could tell like I had on white patent leather shoes and little sure. ankle socks and a <laughs> white dress with crinoline like I used to wear at Easter time. So I was That's like awesome. a little kid. Uh, with like a little white straw hat with fake flowers and a little matching purse. And then I saw like my grandparents on wow. both sides, my aunt Rita, and then Mary Lou said that people who were alive could be there too. And uh, my mom has since passed away, but both my parents appeared. And she said to me in the, in the hip, hip, hypnotic state she said these people have been keeping your french for you till you were ready to come for it and so then my grandfather who's the one who spoke french to me the most because he was born in canada and he didn't speak much english sure. he stepped forward with this little treasure chest and um he puts it in my hands and pats my head and then i start to open it and i can see it's filled with jewels and they're beautiful. And I know it's really the French language, right? That's so and crazy. I want to like flip it open and dig my hands in and let the words and phrases kind of flow through my fingers. But then I start looking at the chest and I think it's not pretty enough. It's not um, what I think it should look like. It's not feminine enough. And then the lid slams shut and I can't get it open. Oh, wow. And then I kind of float to the surface. So it was really a metaphor for the sense of perfectionism sure. that always have has kept me from learning French. Because when you lose the language, then it becomes this precious thing. In the TED Talk, I refer to it as an egg in your hand, that you love the language and you revere the language so wholly that you're profoundly disappointed every time that you start to speak it, right? Like my husband, Gordon Benson Carlyle, um, <laughs> um, who actually lived in Quebec for a while because he had a practice wife that was Quebecois. Okay. Um, so, and he was a portrait artist, artist in old Montreal. He's fearless with the French language. Like we'll go to Canada and he's like speaking. He doesn't care if he makes mistakes. That's awesome. And I will start and then I'll just get freaked out and then sure. I shut myself down. Gotcha. So I think that's a common problem for a lot of people. That's yeah. why I understand. You mentioned a couple times that you spoke it in the, the, the house until you turned three years old. Yeah. What, what happened? So what changed? It's really hard to kind of piece it together. My sister was born when I was two years old. About that time, my mother's father got really sick, and then he died when I was about three. So gotcha. they were going to raise both their children bilingually, but I think it just became too much, you know? They were running a business. They were grieving the loss of my grandfather. They had two kids, you know, one 
newborn and or one years old and one three years old. I think it just became too much for them. And then they started rationalizing it, saying, you know, we don't want you to speak bad French and bad English like your cousins. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. No, that's tough. Now, this going back uh, to reacquire the language kind of something you always knew you were going to do? Or was there like this one incident that made you no, be like, you know what, I'm like going a, back? I gradual dawning and I kept trying different things. And I still haven't mastered the language. You know, I go through fits and uh, spurts with it. But I feel like um, it was interesting. Several years ago, I was interviewed by uh, a woman uh, who was Filipino originally and then moved to the United States and she lost her language. And she had done similar things to me. She had even gone to France and was hypnotized to help her find the language in her head. But she, at the end of the interview, she was a really good interviewer. And she said, if you could learn to speak French, how would that feel? Uh, and I said, it would make me feel successful in my oh, life. Wow. Like, all my yeah. success, uh, you know, it's like still on my bucket list. I like to go and do an immersion, because I think that's what it would take, is just up there on on that big bucket list, because um, it would make me feel complete and successful in this uh, life's quest. I guess. Oh, no, I'm with you. I'm 100% with you. <laughs> I know exactly where that's coming from. That's awesome. Now, you talk about your folks in the yeah. TED Talk and in your work. Maybe you could just tell us about your parents. Uh, my parents are great. My dad is uh, 87. Uh, I was just with him today. I just moved him closer to me. He's in assisted living. Got you. And then my mom died about 15 years ago. But they were high school sweethearts. So uh, a lot of times my life, like I said, weaves back in and out of Ida's world. Sure. So my mom and dad were high school sweethearts. They got married. Um, my dad was a year ahead of my mom. And they got married a couple of years after my mom graduated, I guess. And uh, they had a little auto parts store in Jackman. And my mom was a, a teacher, elementary school teacher. And eventually moved to Westbrook because they couldn't keep a... a a uh, doctor in Jackman at that time. And so they're living in Jackman, which is very isolated in this valley, surrounded by mountains, closest town, Skowhegan, Waterville, about an hour and 15 minutes away. Oh, wow, yeah. And they had two small children. There was this incident where um, my, uh, I had my tonsils out, so I had to do that in Waterville. They had to get stay in a hotel with my sister. Eventually, I came home, and I started to get sick. And my dad called the hospital, and they said, well, you can bring her back, like a six, a sick seven-year-old. You can bring her back in an hour and 15 minutes over the mountains. We yeah. can't prescribe anything over the phone. So finally... Somebody, my grandmother had that store and she was crying in the store and somebody came in and they said, what's the matter? She told them. And they said, I think there's a doctor from like Massachusetts hunting in the woods. I'm going to go get him and see if he can help Susan. Wow. And so they got the doctor. He was none too pleased to come out. I had an <laughs> ear, ear infection and my dad drove two and a half hours round trip to fill that prescription. Wow. And when he came home, he said, that's it. That's a good reason. So they ended up moving to Westbrook because uh, my mom got a job teaching. So they decided to plan it around my mom. So she became, she was a second grade teacher in Westbrook for 30 years. Um, My dad started, he was the 12th person hired in this automotive uh, distributor business. He had an auto parts store in Jackman and he worked his way up from the loading dock to be general uh, sales manager of that business. And he spent all his working life in the automotive distributor business and retired when he was 56. So he's been retired like 30 years now. Uh, And he was the general manager of Stego Auto Parts for New England, which was the biggest, yeah, pretty good for graduating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Third out of six, that's Uh, awesome. Now, you mentioned uh, some trips to Quebec. As yeah, we used to go to Quebec a lot when I was a kid. And then we stopped, but um, uh, we'll go periodically now, my husband and I. 
And I love going to Quebec and I love going to Montreal. Yeah. Now, did you look forward to it when you were a kid too? I'm just wondering if that it was different when you were a child. Listen. Well, yeah, it was fun. Usually we would go visit relatives there. I, I remember also just tales of my parents going, you know, uh, to big uh, parties in uh, in uh, Quebec. Like I remember them telling this story about going to a wedding in Quebec that was three days long. <laughs> And uh, my my aunt, my mother's sister, she had gotten a, a new pair of loafers before she left, and she wore a hole in the bottom of them dancing. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's a good reason to do it. Those that's are cool. good parties. Yeah, that sounds like a good party. I'm not sure my liver would be able to handle a three-day yeah. wedding. But <laughs> that's so cool. Now, something sorry, I have to ask about, because it's, it absolutely happened to me, so I thought it was really, really funny. Uh, was about when you tried to order in French in a restaurant in Quebec City. I try to order in French anything, and they always just, I just completely fall apart. And they always switch to English, or they start, you know, if I, I can practice what I'm going to say, I talk about it in the TED Talk, and I think I'm pretty good at it, my accent's okay, and then they start to speak French to me in my brain <laughs> short circuits. Right. And you don't hear what the, you know. I'm just. It sounds like they're going blah 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 blah. Suzanne, <laughs> blah blah blah. Why? Right? Yes. You know? <laughs> no. When you talk that, it's hilarious because I was at a Saint Hubert once in Quebec City, and I thought I was ready. I had yeah. practice. I was going to order for the table. I was going to be the cool guy. I got my French down to know what everybody's going to get. And I placed the order, and the same thing happened. The waiter came back at me with the follow-up question, and I was completely lost. Yeah, it's so scary. It was funny, because I told that story to a uh, guy that I met through the podcast. No, a friend of mine who lives in Drummondville, and he just started laughing at me. He's like, he was asking about the coleslaw, right? I'm like, yes. I did not know the French word for coleslaw. He got me there, but yeah. What, what <laughs> is it? <laughs> I have no idea. I just knew what he was saying. He was asking me if I wanted a creamy or non-creamy coleslaw, and I had absolutely no idea what he was asking. But yeah, wow. so I've been there. That's really neat. Now, one thing I think was really cool in this TED Talk is you bring up some of the major major questions and the major points uh that we have discussed over the course of this podcast probably a giant motivator uh for why the podcast exists uh, and you note that you once asked yourself whether you could be a good franco-american if you can't speak french yeah how would you answer that today i i would say absolutely i think that that it's you can be raised biculturally sure and not bilingually and that if we say you have to speak French to be Franco-American, we're being exclusive instead of inclusive. And by coming back to the culture first, you're much more likely to try to reconnect with French, like yourself, right? That yeah. it's like rediscover, uh, rediscovering the culture. But if we say you have to speak French, then you're just, it's just too overwhelming. I mean, I, I just wouldn't even try. Right. Yet I know for me, even my sister who never spoke French and doesn't really like self-identify in the same way as I do. Any interview I do, you know, I always self-identify as Franco-American. It's really sure. important for me that I'm visible as a Franco-American. But my sister, she was taking some, she was studying to be a feng shui consultant anyway. <laughs> She's taking <laughs> okay. this big class. And it was like a, a week long thing. A woo -woo, yeah. And um, the person she became friendliest with was a woman from Montreal who is French. And it was because she was culturally familiar to my sister. There That's is awesome. something about her that she liked right off the bat and she connected with. And yes. Jane has never spoken French. So I think that's what, it's a heart connection. I, I mean, I talk about it that in the, in the TED Talk. You know, I only spoke the language till I was three years old, but I understood it longer. Sure. I heard it longer. It is the language of love. It is the language of my heart. English is the language of my mind, right? So I am almost uh, split when I'm out in public, you know, and I do not feel, I, I know, I don't always feel like I have the rule book of the dominant culture, right? Uh, that I could be too emotional, too uh, out there with my, the way I talk. 
and I've had to learn to kind of uh, pull back a little in certain circles, right? Gotcha. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Now, you mentioned that Frank, this is another topic that's come up time and time again. I thought your, interest, your answer was interesting. Uh, you mentioned that Franco-Americans are the third largest ethnic group in New England, number one in northern New England, yet kind of nobody knows we're here or nobody knows or has heard of us. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Well, I I talk about it in the TED talk. I think I think the I didn't I didn't say that this in the TED, TED talk. I think the Catholic Church, you know, of course, had a lot to do with it in that at the beginning, really wanting um, Franco Americans to not assimilate, sure, to, be, to get that place in heaven. You had to per, uh, preserve your language, your culture, and your faith. Uh, eventually, they kind of pulled back on that. So I think. New England mill towns like Manchester, where you could live your whole life in um, a neighborhood and never have to speak English. Absolutely. I think there's also the illusion that you can go home to Canada. You might not, but there's the illusion that you sure. might be back, right? Yeah. So yep. less, I think just Franco-Americans just kept their head down. Uh, you think of like, Irish in the mills being rabble rousers and union organizers and Franco Americans being quiet. Gotcha. Um, it's just by, you know, and then you have the KKK and you have all of that stuff, which you probably talked about before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know. But I think it's for me, you know, when I talk about being a Franco American, I believe passionately in a personal difference of uh, survivance, right? A personal yes. difference definition of what it means to be franco-american no i'm with that yeah because i've always one of the things we talk about a lot you know that always described as the quiet presence i'm kind of like uh i'm over the quiet presence i'm not super yeah. interested in quiet presence i'm much more interested to be in a very raucous presence that's kind of the presence i want to be well it was it's interesting like in um the first ida show ida woman who runs with the moose at the end of the first act i tell the story about ida and charlie getting married I say, you know, uh, Emile Dugal, I, I'm, I'm always very conscious of using Franco, uh, French names at least like 40% of the time, <laughs> all my okay. writing, right? To yes. reflect the demographic of the state of Maine, right? Sure. To make Franco-Americans visible in my writing. But in the play, I say, you know, at, we knew our wedding, we knew our wedding was official when Emile Dugal sang Prends d'un coup. Everyone That's in the cool. town, the minute he get a buzz on, he sing the song. <laughs> he would start singing the song. Everyone would sing along. And then I sing the song. That's all. Awesome. And I was doing the play, and I had done lots of performances of this play. And I was doing it in, at the Public Theater in Lewiston, Maine. Sold out show, 300 people. And Lewiston, of course, very, very Franco-American, right? Absolutely, yeah. I started to sing that song, and people in the audience started singing along. I would have lost it. Oh, I man. did lose it. I <laughs> did. I had to like pull myself back together. And then people would come up to me afterwards and say, it's the first time I've seen uh, myself presented on the stage. Right. That's so nutty. You know, that's and that's so important. That's it's so, so crazy. You, you can know, connect with people like that. You can yeah. have that impact on people in your audience. That's so awesome. Yeah, and I always do that, like, in my book readings. In the first book, um, Finding Your Inner Moose, about the moose qualities and blah, blah. The wise person in that is Ida's grandfather, uh, Frederick Gilbert. And she, she would say, you know, he was born in... Uh, Canada dropped out of school after eighth grade and moved to Quebec in his teens. He spoke French, of course, and Frenchified English, or franglais, as we call it, but was basically illiterate in both languages. But, so she, uh, which is really actually my grandfather <laughs> on my mother's side. Sure. But uh, he's the wise person in the book. Like, he's the one who uh, has the, you know, like the really good quotes for Ida and stuff like that. And when I do a book reading, I always do that with um, a Frank Franco accent. So, you know, uh, Grampy Gilbert would say, uh, I'd be talking as Ida, but then if I talk as Grampy Gilbert, sure. he's going to say, Mon petit chou. 
you know, gotcha. you think yeah. like that, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> Me, awesome. I think today is a new day. I can't wait to see how many fish I'm going to catch. Huh? <laughs> so, so, you awesome. know, it's really important for me to bring that accent. Uh, that's yes. cool. The one thing that people can do to get me riled, like in public, if I'm talking to say something about Franco-Americans, is if they say, well, I've, I, learn, I speak French, but when I go to Canada, I can't understand oh, anything. Oh, man. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? That will get me riled. Yeah, okay. I can see that, yeah. You know, that sense of standard French and colloquial sure. French being absolutely valid. And so uh, that that's one thing I will get kind of miffed about. <laughs> I'm with you there. I think that's a good thing. Now, this has been a blast. We could do this forever. But I can't end the chat about the TED Talk uh, without mentioning something you said that absolutely got me all kinds of excited. Because it's something uh, Mike and I addressed in even the preview to this entire podcast project. And that is, for a while now, I'm hearing the narrative over and over and over again that the Franco-American culture if it's not dead, it's at least dying. It was the story that you hear all the time, and that's not, I have a very different view. Uh, I'm gonna brag about myself. The answer I gave to that was the same exact one you gave in your TED Talk, which I thought was so cool. So what is your answer to somebody who tells you the Franco-American culture is dying? I say it's not dying, it's changing. Uh, I always quote uh, Greg Washabo, the yeah. playwright who says, Preservation is for meat, not culture. Like if you just <laughs> want it to stay the same, it's going to become dead, right? Um, so you have to let it evolve and be in the modern day, right? I mean, one of the highlights of my year every year, and that's where I met you, is going to the Rassemblement Absolutely. at uh, yeah. the University of Maine, Orono. Once a year, we get together for a retreat, a weekend-long retreat, Franco, American, Quebecois, writers, performers, researchers, bloggers, podcasters, educators. And we get to hang out with people who are culturally familiar, get to meet young people as you're, like yourself, really connecting with the culture and moving it forward in the modern day. People who are trying to connect with the language, not connecting with the language. You've had all these people on, on your podcast. And it's just so important to let the culture evolve and go where it needs to go, right? I love that. I love that so much. All right, so this is so cool. Now, you have obviously a completely crazy, very full schedule. If listeners want to find the TED Talk, your books, the blog, podcasts, your YouTube page, which actually has a bunch of really funny stuff on it, uh, upcoming shows, where can we send these listeners? So you can go to poolisle.com, P-O-O-L-Y-L-E.com, or you could go to idaswebsite.com, <laughs> and that will connect you, because I have my my website, Pool Isle. Uh, which has the TED Talk, and it has other things that I do as well. I do keynote speaking and teaching workshops on creative process and staying in flow. Um, and then Ida's um, website, and uh, Ida has a Facebook page as well that connects. And like I said, every Monday on justassida.com, um, my uh, blog goes up, so uh, Ida's <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, what's next? You still writing? We got another play coming? Well, I think um, uh, depending on when this is airing, it's best for people to uh, drop by my website and check the schedule there. There's Ida's schedule and then my other schedule as well. Well, this has been an absolute blast. Thank you again, oh, so much Susan, fun. for doing this podcast. Yeah, we've been listening Yay. to Susan Poulin. Here on the French uh, French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Again, thank you. Thank you very much. Merci. This has been cool. <laughs> this was just great. Thank you. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive
special thanks to josie vachon for providing the music. you can find more about her at josievachon dot com this podcast was produced and edited by mike campbell if you have any questions or comments please email us at fcl podcast at gmail dot com you can also follow us on facebook twitter and instagram at fcl podcast for more information about the topics discussed if you enjoyed the show please subscribe and leave us a review on itunes or wherever you listen to this episode